Well, look, I can't emphasize enough again how important the subject is. It's not like for our immediate purposes, obviously we want to understand the origins of the Great Depression, which produced political convulsions across Europe, not least the rise of Hitler to power with all of those world historical consequences. We'll look at that next week. But, I mean, it, it led to almost like this eruption in the, in the political continuum where, you know, for decades afterwards, it didn't just give a certain credibility to the Marxist critique of capitalism. It led a lot of people not only to sympathize with the Soviet Union, but even many of them literally to go there. I mean, one of the saddest stories of the Greatest Depression to me is that listening to the critique of capitalism in the popular press, no less than 100,000 Americans voluntarily went to Stalin's Soviet Union in search of employment because they were told it was a worker's paradise. What happened to them? We don't really know. Most of them ended up in the gulag. In fact, disproportionately represented among those Americans were blacks, African Americans, because they were particularly targeted by communist propaganda. And many of them actually went, there's, there's a great article about this, it was published about 10 years ago. Many of them ended up you know, in the labor camps in the Soviet Union. Not all of them died. Some of them were still there in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, there, there's a great scene in um, the 1980s movie called White Nights with Mikhail Baryshnikov, the famous ballet dancer, and uh, Gregory Hines, who is an American, you know, kind of an African-American, like he's, he's a tap dancer, you know, he's a... Well, anyway, so what happens is Baryshnikov, you know, he, he was a Russian, and he had gone to the West. He had emigrated, uh, basically illegally, you know, while performing in New York. And he was on a flight to Japan, and the plane went down in the Soviet Union. Oops! And so, you know, they took him in jail, and in the end, they shacked him up with Gregory Hines. Gregory Hines, the U.S. dancer, you know, this, this kind of African-American tap dancer was supposed to kind of like chaperone him. And we learned Gregory Hines' story, which is that his parents had gone over there in the 1930s. And now 40 years later, he was performing Porgy and Bess and like these other <laughs> classics of like American pop culture for these audiences in Siberia who didn't understand a word of it. It's a really bizarre story, but it's true. 100,000 Americans went to the Soviet Union in the 1930s looking for work. You know, because they were told capitalism was done. I mean, that's how dramatic the Great Depression was, just in terms of the global political landscape. And, I mean, even inside the quote-unquote capitalist world, even inside the West, you know, the controversies about it continue to embroil us. In fact, in some ways, the original Keynesian interpretation of the Great Depression was somewhat invalidated by the 1970s stagflation, and some people are now beginning to critique it in light of what happened in the last two or three years. So the interpretation of these events is in some ways almost as important as the events themselves. Because as Keynes himself said famously, politicians are all slaves to some defunct economist. Nearly every pronouncement on kind of public policy that you hear today has some echo in what people think happened in 1929. Most people tend to think along the Keynesian line, that is, that unregulated capitalism led to a great crash, ergo we need more regulation. Um, well, of course, no one would doubt that you need certain regulations and laws. I mean, you can't operate a country without them. The nature of the regulation, though, that is a matter of considerable controversy. So, to get back to where this crash came from, and in fact, to some extent, the stock market crash himself, a, a lot of people confuse it with the Great Depression, you know, partly because of the dates. The Great Depression, you, you tend to date it from like roughly, maybe like 1931 until no one really knows even when it ended. I mean, in American terms, it, it ended in terms of output, not until about 1941. Germany began recovering earlier than anyone else in Europe. In Germany, it was mostly over by 1935. Britain, it was a little bit later. Basically, you could say like the 1930s as a whole. Almost the whole decade was marked by this so-called Great Depression, which is not the same thing as the stock market crash. If you look at dates, it looks like one thing caused the other. And to some extent, that was probably true. You know, the one thing was a necessary condition of the Great Depression. That's not to say that it necessarily led to it in a straight line, however. Because after all, stock market bubbles are not that uncommon. Markets tend to crash. In March 2000, 
You were all probably alive then, although I doubt you remember it very much. How old were you guys in 2000? Like 10 years old. So you probably don't remember the NASDAQ crash of March 2000. Probably not. Well, anyway, the NASDAQ, this is the... This is sort of the, the, the more modern, you know, high-tech stock market where, you know, companies like Microsoft used to trade. Um, well, anyway, the NASDAQ, the kind of index of your sort of like high-tech stocks crashed. And when I say it crashed, I mean it really crashed. It went from a peak of about 5,300 down to about 1,500. It's still, I think, trading in the range of about 2,000. Is still that it hasn't gotten anywhere near where it was in March 2000, even 10 years later. And yet there was no Great Depression in 2001. There was a recession. Uh, even this term, recession versus depression, which um, I should probably learn the Turkish words for these, but do you have your own version of depression? D depression? <laughs> what, what is it? Crease, that's right. Everyone says crease. Like a couple of years ago, you all said crease den, hashtag crease den. You know, all the car companies were shutting down crease den, crease den. Yeah, I heard that a lot. So anyway, crease, maybe it does make sense to simply roll them into one term. Um, I mean, there is a technical definition now of recession, which is something like negative economic growth lasting two quarters. But it's one of these like pseudo-scientific terms, which is not nearly as precise as people pretend. And that's because economic measurements are not as precise as people pretend. The figures always get revised later, and that's because you don't tend to know what actually happened until you know, the dust has settled and you've actually had time to make accounts. Depression is supposedly this big different thing, you know, lasting much longer or with like negative economic growth and you know, usually some kind of deflation. Well, the terms did not used to be distinct until this Great Depression. Everyone just called it a depression. It was like a normal thing, you know, a downturn in the business cycle. You know, maybe there was a run on the banks, a bank panic, economic activity contracted, and then eventually you know, things settled out. If you can tell by looking at this chart, this was a particularly sharp bubble being burst. Um, again, roughly in, well, I mean, basically it was October 1929. You might have heard of Black Tuesday or Black Thursday. They, they called them all the same thing. Black Friday. There's Black Friday. Uh, you know, I brought Black Friday was the one where the bankers actually jumped out of the window, like 11 committed suicide or something. But Black Tuesday was in some ways even worse because Black Tuesday went like this. You know, it went like just literally almost down in a straight line. Well, you can tell. It's, it is. It's like it goes down in a straight line. Yeah. Oh, you, you didn't get enough? Yes. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't maybe count them very closely. Yeah, please pass that out. So you can see it is. It's a very sharp drop. You can also see roughly where the bubble begins in terms of like beginning to lose its relation to economic reality. The thing about the Great Depression, though, which you can actually begin to see here on this graph, that's so strange and anomalous, the reason it was such a dramatic event, is the bubble didn't just go back to kind of where it was before. You know, you can see this level around 150, 200. This is in terms of, you know, corporate earnings. The, 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 the numbers don't matter. What matters is the level. You can see that for a while, you know, corporate earnings, that is basically income, is rising and stocks are rising. And then sometime around 1927, you know, the stock values start to shoot off into the stratosphere. They start to lose all relation to economic reality. And then they come back to economic reality. The problem is that economic reality, instead of continuing its kind of moderate path of moderate growth, suddenly plunged to the floor. So that the bubble didn't just go back to where it was before, but went basically almost all the way down to zero. So the question is why? You know, why did this particular cycle take on such ferocious and frightening overtones. And when I say frightening, I mean literally frightening. People thought the world was ending. You know, you had unemployment figures around 30 and 40 percent. You had a collapse in national income, you know, in the factor of tens, a geometric decrease that is in production, in income, within the end millions of people being thrown out of work, you know, where in Europe you had these scenes of catastrophe that helped produce, you know, in the end, we'll look at Hitler's rise to power and how chancy it was, but it would not have been possible without this economic chaos and misery and catastrophe. Now, so why? Why was this bubble different?
Well, again, this is still extremely controversial. I want to explain a few things about where the bubble came from. There were a couple of anomalies in the economy of the 1920s, that is, things which were odd or strange or unusual. The reparations problem we've already talked about, you know, the credit issue with the loans, that was a big part of it, that the U.S. was trying very hard to inflate the European economy. In some ways, one of the most important factors uh, was actually the relation of the dollar to the pound sterling. Now this was because, if you remember, going back to before the war, the dollar had been pegged at about $4.86 to one pound. Both of them then pegged in turn, of course, to gold. That was called the gold standard, the classic gold standard. Now, I talked about, a f in a few lectures ago, I talked about this notion that the U.S. and Britain sort of pursued a more hard money policy. That is, you know, instead of allowing the value of the currency to drop, they sort of propped it up. They tried to peg it to gold. That was true. Compared to like what the French or the Germans did with big time inflation, that was true. There were limits to how hard this money really was. You know, it wasn't like this hard. You know, it was like maybe like this. You know, it was like, eh, it was, it was harder than some of the other currencies, but it wasn't that hard. And the reason was because the gold standard was a fictitious one. It was not a real gold standard. You could not literally go to the banks and ask for gold in exchange for your dollars and your sterling. That is because the bankers did not entirely trust, first of all, the people, which is to say the people didn't trust the banks. The banks were afraid of the people. But basically, the circumstances after the First World War were precarious. Britain went back on the gold standard just barely. And in fact, it probably did make a mistake. This is what Churchill was, I think, maybe, you know, partly fairly blamed for. They tried very hard to go back at the old rate. That is, for reasons of prestige and tradition, the authority of the Bank of England, they did not want the pound to lose its value. So that they waited until they could get the exchange rate to this before they went back on gold. It's, again, it sounds arcane, but it's actually very important. I talked about what the Germans did with their own rate of 4.2. And there, they had a currency which was, remember, in the trillions. It was like 4 to 5 trillion marks to the dollar. They waited until it hit 4.2 trillion, and then they brought in this new currency backed on land so that they themselves could actually peg it to the dollar at the old rate. But they were able to do that just basically because they chopped off about 11 zeros. The British were not able to chop off zeros. The British had to suffer. Okay. So when the British went back on the gold standard in 1925, it was difficult. You know, the banks had to try very, very hard with very high interest rates. The thing about interest rates, again, they sound arcane, but they're extremely important. I mean, you know how this works in Turkey. When they jack up the FIES, like on your time deposit or savings account, you know, a few years ago, they had it all the way up to like 12%. You know, they do that in part to attract deposits. They don't want you dumping the lira. It's a way of propping up the currency so that you don't buy dollars or sterling or something like that, or euros, you know, or Swiss francs, or gold. It's a way of trying to strengthen the currency. That is, when you knock the interest rates up, you want to keep the money in the country. So Britain had to keep interest rates extremely high to make sure that people would not sell the pound. That is, in order to keep it at this rate, in order to go back on the gold standard, the British kind of had to suffer. They also needed some help from the Americans. And here's where the basic problem, I think, was one of imbalance. You know, the US had such economic strength and such financial power, because it was now the creditor to the world, that it had to almost like try as hard as it could not to strengthen its own currency. It had to sort of like shackle itself. Now, one way it did this was by keeping its own interest rates artificially low. Because the U.S. did not want everyone buying dollars. In fact, the U.S. was trying to help the British prop up the pound. And this is where this relationship, I mentioned these two fellows. I mean, they were actually close friends. They consulted all the time. Benjamin Strong was the chairman of the New York Fed, that is the the New York branch of the Federal Reserve, which was the most important one. It had, like if you've watched Die Hard 3, 
<laughs> Has anyone seen Die Hard 3? You know, with Bruce Willis and Samuel Jackson. They go, they steal the money from the New York Federal Reserve. It's all down there in gold bars. Well, anyway, that's the New York Fed. It's the most important link in the Federal Reserve system. So weirdly, he was not actually chairman of the Federal Reserve. The chairman was in Washington, but the real power lay in New York because that's basically that's where the gold was. So he got together with Montague Norman. He was the chairman of the Bank of England. And they basically began trying to manipulate interest rates together. Again, I mean, nothing nefarious about their intentions. They were trying to help Britain go back on the gold standard, so they kept U.S. interest rates artificially low. That is, if the rates had simply gone to their natural level, they would have been higher. By artificial, that means there was like an intervention. In other words, it's not a quote-unquote laissez-faire sort of regulation. They are trying to push the rates down artificially and prop the British rates up artificially. The reason is because they don't want people selling pounds and buying dollars. Okay, well that all sounds boring enough. The problem was this. Interest rates in America were low which was supposed to encourage people either to sell their dollars or at least not to buy dollars. What it did instead was to encourage people to borrow dollars because after all the interest rates were low. So you could borrow dollars and then you could loan them somewhere else. But of course what a lot of people did was they borrowed dollars cheaply and they used them to speculate in the stock market. Now up to about 1927 this was not necessarily that serious a problem. But there was a notorious meeting, and it's, again, one of these things. I love the idea of, you know, conspiracy theories. You're not supposed to believe in them, and, and yes, most of them are hogwash. On the other hand, there really was a secret meeting of bankers. It's like you can kind of like cue the dramatic Hollywood music, right? In September 1927, Strong and Norman met with a bunch of other, you know, U.S. and British bankers, many of them private, and they would, they would literally do it in this, like, cloak and dagger way. You know, they would travel under false names so the press didn't know what they were doing. They would go to like some secret hideaway on an island so no one would know what they were doing. And then they would kind of secretly conspire together in order to do what they thought was best for the global economy. You know, kind of like a private version of what they do at the Davos conference these days. You know, where all those obnoxious billionaire plutocrats get together and tell us what's what. Well, here's what they decided. They decided that the British pound was not basically going to last unless the U.S. tried even harder to lower rates. Now, you're not usually supposed to lower rates during a big economic boom. Now, the reason is simple. You know, you don't want to encourage speculation. Whenever the economy is growing, you know, that means people are making money, people are also starting businesses. Some of them may be good ideas, some of them not so good ideas. Eventually, some of them are going to fail. The thing is, when the economy is heating up like this, you don't generally want to kind of like inject jet fuel into it. You know, if the economy is already going like this, you know, you don't want to put, let's say it's like an arm, you don't want to put steroids into it, right? Because maybe it's going to go through the roof and then of course it'll crash straight down. He actually literally used this phrase. He didn't use uh, steroids or jet fuel. He used a different metaphor. He called it whiskey. <laughs> he said, I am going to quote, inject a coup de whiskey into the stock market. That is, I'm going to make the stock market a little bit drunk. He did this by lowering interest rates dramatically. Well, actually, it, wasn't, it was only by like a point. But the thing is, it was enough to make a big difference because at the time, the economy was, as I said, booming. And the, the stock market was just beginning to take off. And he gave it like a little nudge, a little coup de whiskey. And you can see what happens. The bubble began literally right then in the fall of 1927 with Benjamin Strong's coup de whiskey to the stock market. So now you get, again, this massive gap. You know, stocks go from trading at maybe like five times annual earnings. That means like their valuation is about five times their earnings. Then they jack up to 10% and then 20%. And by the time the bubble was at its height, they were trading at about 50 times annual earnings. In other words, there was one phrase like they were discounting stocks not merely against the future, but also the hereafter. You know, that is, you were expecting them to grow by some ridiculous percentage, like even into the afterlife after you and everyone else were dead. It didn't make any sense. Why were they worth 50 times what a company earned? It didn't make any sense. You know, it'd be like, there's a company that makes $10 a year and, you know, you are actually valuing it at, 
50 times that amount, which would be, what, $500. Doesn't make any sense. It would take the company 50 years at best to even make that amount of money. And you're saying it's worth that now. It doesn't make any sense. So you have a, a, a big gap now, a big gap between the actual sort of real economy and the stock market. Well, so everyone, here's the thing. It wasn't a surprise. Everyone knew the thing was going to burst. It's not like it was some big secret. Yes, there were some people, like th there were these two goofy economists 10 years ago who wrote this famous article in the Atlantic Monthly called The Dow 36,000. That is the, uh, the Dow Index, the Dow Jones Index, which at the time was about, at about 11,000. You know, today it's about maybe like 12,000. And they said it was going to go up to 36,000. And they came up with all these crazy arguments. Reality doesn't exist anymore because of the internet and globalization and blah, 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 blah. You know, all of the old factors which govern things like earnings and money do no longer exist because we now exist in a new plane of existence. People always come up with these rationalizations during great big booms. They did it 10 years ago, right before the NASDAQ collapsed, and they did it in 1929. But not everyone was doing that. A lot of people knew beforehand it was going to go south. A lot of people started selling out in the summer of 1929. Winston Churchill, incidentally, did not. <laughs> Winston Churchill lost virtually everything in the stock market in 1929, despite supposedly being this brilliant, well-connected guy. So not everyone got out in time. But it's not like it was a big secret. You know, people were talking about it in the press. You know, the stock bubble, when is it going to burst, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, on come Black Tuesday, Black Thursday, Black Friday. Okay, first it was Black Thursday, then Friday, then Tuesday. Yes, yeah, so you got this big dramatic scene you know, the stocks are plunging, you know, and it all, it all sort of feeds on itself. You know, everyone starts to panic, so they, so they start to sell. And then, you know, people realize that no one else is buying, and so you get even more sellers. And the whole thing feeds on itself, and you got almost a vertical drop where stocks, you know, they had been at something like 450 you know, points, almost 400 points, and they dropped down to roughly where they were back before the bubble was created. Well, that shouldn't have been that much of a problem. Now, stocks lost their relationship with reality, and then they had a rude awakening, which, as you can see on the chart, brought them down by, say, early 1930 into a much closer relation with reality. Well, yes, they were probably going to keep going a little bit further down, just because just as the stock mania you know, goes up in one direction, it's going to go in the other. But here's where the kind of proverbial excrement hits the fan. Why did you then go, you know, not just back to where you were before, but even further, right through the floor, until eventually you had this global economic depression? Well, again, the more traditional Keynesian argument is not enough government regulation, not enough sort of uh, intervention in the market that, you know, you, you needed government policy to kind of keep the market inflated and stabilize the economy. The Keynesian arguments, you know, before it was called Keynesianism, I mean, Keynes himself had to use another word. He wasn't going to label it after himself. You know, so he had, the phrase he liked was stabilization. You know, the idea was, the government, and particularly the central banks, are supposed to somehow intervene to smooth out the business cycle, to stabilize prices. Now, it's curious that the Keynesian argument that supposedly this didn't happen before the Great Depression, I mean, it's false on its face because Keynes actually knew these central bankers and, in fact, corresponded with them. In fact, Keynes approved of everything Benjamin Strong did until about 1928, well, when he died. Benjamin Strong, that is, not Keynes. Now, Keynes liked what he was doing with kind of intervening in the credit markets and so on. So his idea of stabilizing the business cycle, he also criticized, if you remember, uh, going back onto the gold standard. You know, so his idea was, again, the gold standard, you know, it's, it's like a relic. You don't need it. And he had a good point there. I mean, the gold standard was sort of a relic. What it was supposed to mean, literally, is that banks could not create money that was not backed by gold which again, theoretically, they called them golden fetters, like it was a cage. You, know, you couldn't expand beyond the bounds of what you physically held in your vaults. Of course, in practice, that wasn't true because by loaning money, that is by kind of creating money out of thin air, banks were already inflating the economy beyond what you had with gold. Still, maybe he had a point about Britain going back on the gold standard and propping up the pound artificially. You know, Keynes had always said the pound was overvalued, they should allow it to drop. So, okay, they did do that. They did that not until uh, 1931. But meanwhile, what did the U.S. government do? 
The laissez-faire approach, the, the silent cal approach, would be to do what? Yeah, not to do anything, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the idea. It's called stasis. I mean, they, they used to have a word for this. <laughs> the virtue of doing nothing, basically, <laughs> stasis. Um, you know, you allow prices to fall. Deflation. Deflation, oddly enough, the term deflation has turned into like a really dirty word. Ben Helicopter Bernanke has been giving speeches for years talking about the dangers of deflation. Well, I mean, I'll break it to you, Ben. We're in no danger of deflation, not with you creating trillions of dollars out of thin air. But what does it literally mean? It means falling prices. Is that a bad thing? Well, I mean, it depends, right? If you're trying to sell something, it's a bad thing. If you're trying to buy something, it's a good thing. It's just like anything. There's a little bit of good and there's a little bit of bad. I mean, this is where the boom of the 1920s gets to be interesting. Because if you look, again, kind of like behind the lines, productivity and profits were rising. Prices were supposedly falling because supposedly the U.S. was pursuing deflationary policies under Harding and Coolidge. But prices actually didn't really fall very much. They kind of like stayed about like this. Prices, meaning like how much you actually pay for goods. We're all used to inflation now. I mean, we've been living in inflationary times for decades now because we're all disciples of Keynes. But in the 19th century, deflation was actually normal. Everyone was on the gold standard, so the supply of money was reasonably con constant. So what would happen? Well, as businesses would get more productive, the prices of things would fall. That still happens with certain goods. Like you might have heard of Moore's Law about microprocessors. Computers, right? They get more and more powerful. The prices sort of fall, but they don't really fall. The reason is because, of course, we have monetary inflation. So even though computers are now more efficient and they're built more efficiently and at lower cost, the prices don't go down. That's what was happening in the 1920s. You had a kind of invisible inflation. You had a resistance to deflation. The same way Bernanke today denounces deflation, that's what they were trying to do. They did not want prices to fall. There was also an issue to do with wages. You know, again, and all of this stuff is kind of like wrapped up together, particularly in the way Keynes saw it. There was supposedly an almost iron law that is between wages and interest rates. This is orthodox Keynesian theory. Keynes himself was more subtle, but this is like your Keynesian economist says this. Look, you know, you try to increase interest rates, you know, if the economy is expanding in part to slow it down and in part to control inflation. When the economy is slow or contracting, then you lower interest rates. You have to watch wages, though, because supposedly wages, how much people are paid, is an indicator of inflation. So if you have inflation, wages will go up. That was Keynesian theory. It seems to have been blown out of the water, though, in the 1970s, after the first oil shock, when you had basically both inflation and also the stagnation of wages. Now, the laws are not really that iron. They are not that firmly cut. So wages, the idea is, look, wages, I mean, what would you think would happen if you have like a downturn in the business cycle? That is, economic activity is contracting, companies are laying off workers. What? Wages will fall. Right. What actually happened in the U.S. between 1929, the crash, and 1932 is that wages actually rose which is very strange when you think about it. The economy is kind of collapsing and yet wages actually rose. Why did they? It was actually, con it was literally conscious policy on the part of the government. The president, Herbert Hoover, got the heads of a bunch of corporations together and he told them, look, we don't want wages to fall. They also didn't want prices to fall. And they also didn't want banks to fail. And so they injected money into the banking system they injected money into industry, especially construction. They injected money into agriculture, uh, about $500 million alone, you know, sent to farmers. Um, another $3 billion sent into construction and the housing market. They also spent, you know, government money, deficit spending. They borrowed, they ran a deficit of about $2.2 .2 billion in 1931. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but, you know, in the context of the time, it was actually significant. 
you know, compared to the budget of several years ago, of like Harding, it was like 70% of that budget. But of course, under Hoover, government spending was now rising again. Hoover was a Keynesian. Hoover, who was president from 1929 to 1933, he's actually called the Depression president. Now, he, he didn't call himself a Keynesian. What he liked to call himself was a corporatist. Now, it's interesting because corporatism, as understood by Herbert Hoover, was actually the model for the European Union. I don't think they teach you that in this department, but it's true. Um, Hoover was actually a hero of Jean Monnet and the founders of you know, the original Schumann plan, the coal and steel community, which turned into the European Union. What they liked about Hoover's philosophy was, now he wasn't a socialist, he definitely believed in you know, the free market up to a point, but he thought that labor and capital partly as a way of like circumventing Marx and the communists. They should get together and basically like sit down on boards together and determine together what wages should be. Cooperatively. That was the idea. Again, it sounds great. It actually, you know, and if it works, it's actually very nice because the workers are happy. You know, management feels like they've kind of cut a deal, you know, so everyone's happy, supposedly. And that's literally what they did in 1930 and 1931. Wages actually went up contrary to apparently the laws of economics. Oh, meanwhile, what was the Fed doing? Again, the usual argument is not enough. That's not what they did at all. Right after the stock market crash, in October and November of 1929, they injected about $500 million of credit. Basically the same thing as Ben Helicopter Bernanke is doing right now. You know, that is money out of thin air. They're creating credits and loans, backed by nothing. They injected this into the system, that is, they loaned a bunch of money to prop up banks. Uh, rates, which had gone back up, you know, basically because of the excessive boom, rates dropped from 6% to 2.5%. So you have here basically like three or four of the classic elements of Keynesian interventionism. You have money being injected into the system, you have interest rates basically being lowered, you have a massive increase in government spending, deficit spending. And then you have, you know, literal intervention in sectors of the economy like farms, uh, construction, uh, and then also banks. A lot of banks were propped up, you know, with money from the Federal Reserve, some of them even with money from some of the programs created under Hoover. Now it's curious because, again, the traditional story is that under FDR, you know, when FDR became president in 1933, now his so-called New Deal you know, it was elegantly marketed, you know, the idea that government would now have a new relation to the people, to the economy and so on. Nearly all of the major initiatives that are usually associated with the New Deal actually began under Hoover. FDR was kind of credited with them later, you know, in part because basically the guy had a lot more charm than Hoover did. I mean, Hoover was totally charmless and dour and boring and pessimistic and he couldn't give a speech, you know, worth his life. FDR was a great speech man. I mean, he would give these speeches like, now, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. And that supposedly made everyone feel better, which it probably did. But anyway, so you look at their policies. And in fact, most of the initial kind of deficit spending investment in these sectors, propping up of sectors of the economy, began under Hoover. And in fact, Hoover actually spent more in terms of deficit spending than FDR did the first couple of years. FDR, in fact, ran for office criticizing Hoover for running a budget deficit. Now, that doesn't make him unusual. I mean, in those days, the kind of political orthodoxy was that governments were supposed to balance their budgets. It's kind of funny that now no one even pays lip service to this. I mean, Obama just submitted a budget to the Congress proposing a $1.7 trillion deficit this year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you say so. Now here's where it gets really interesting, because if you talk about deficit spending, the U.S. last year, uh, again to move this up to the, the present day, the U.S. last year ran a budget deficit, at least officially, unofficially maybe much larger than this, of about one and a half trillion dollars. Now you heard there was a recovery, I guess, economic recovery, growth rates of around two to three percent. Okay, growth rates of two to three percent, size of the U.S. economy is about 15 trillion dollars. So if any of you are good with math, 2 to 3% of $15 trillion is roughly what? Anybody good? Well, it's like $400 billion. Okay. So the U.S. economy 
grew by $400 billion, but the U.S. borrowed $1.5 trillion. Is that economic growth? Like, let's say your income in a month increased by 400 lira, and yet your debt, the money you owe, increased by 1,500 lira. Would you say you're better off? I don't think so. Now, here's, here's the problem with the Great Depression. It's true the sums were much smaller then. You know, and part of, I think, the traditional Keynesian argument probably does hold some water in that the, the hands of the government, to a certain extent, were tied. You know, $2.2 .2 billion in deficit spending. Well, the economy was by then about, you know, $70 billion, and so that's only about 3% of the size of the economy. So that's the argument. It's not enough. Hoover should have spent even more. The banks should have borrowed even more money. And you're actually hearing that argument today, oddly enough, that Bernanke's policy and the stimulus package passed in the U.S., that the U.S. did not borrow enough money, that they should have actually borrowed $3 trillion last year instead of $1.5 trillion. Now, I find that argument, you know, really flabbergasting on its face. I understand the point, though. Now, the idea is, again, like, how much credit do you need to inject to improve confidence? Now, no one knows. It's not like there is some magic figure. The part that does not always get emphasized, though, is that money, while it can be created in a way, money is also fungible. What that means is that money that you don't spend on one thing, you can spend on something else. You know, an example of this is something like oil prices. The problem is that if you have to spend more on oil, you can't spend as much on other things, right? So that's why when you get an oil shock, eventually it hurts almost everyone, except for people who happen to produce oil. The same thing is true, though, with loaning money, with credit. Let's say you have deficit spending, like the $1.5 trillion the U.S. borrowed last year. Well, where does that come from? Some of it might come from, you know, like helicopters, but where does the rest of it come from? It doesn't come from nowhere, right? It comes from banks, mostly, right? I mean, some of the U.S., of course, a lot of it is borrowed from central banks in places like China and Japan, famously, right? Okay, so banks are loaning money to a government. Well, if banks are loaning money to this government or to another government, then who's loaning money to business? Now you have the real contraction. The real contraction is in what is called commercial credit. And here you have a figure, let's say in one year from September 1931 to summer 1932. The amount of credit provided to business dropped by 20%. And that happened to be the year that Hoover was borrowing all of that money for all of his public works projects. Now, maybe some of these things worked. You know, that's the thing. It's like they might have worked. They propped up farmers so that farmers didn't go out of business. They propped up banks so that banks didn't fail. You know, they propped up other businesses so those businesses didn't fail. They propped up wages so that people with jobs actually had really good wages. But then there were other people who didn't have jobs, and they didn't have anything. And there were other businesses that didn't get propped up by the government, and they couldn't get money because the government wasn't loaning to them. Uh, I mean, I have actually some personal recent experience of this just in the past several years. You probably heard that one of the factors in the most recent crash was the housing sort of bubble, right? That people were loaning money to people who couldn't really afford houses. They started failing on their payments, and so credit dried up. Well, that's true. Like five years ago, if you wanted to buy a house, they would just shower you with money. You barely even had to have income. I mean, it's amazing. They would give you these teaser loans with no money down. You know, in other words, you can have a $500,000 house and you don't have to pay anything. Okay, true. You know, in a little while, we're going to jack up your interest rate to 20% and you're going to be in like financial hawk and slavery to us. But, you know, in the short term, it sounds great. And what happened then was two years later, these teaser rates went like this. And then all the banks started to fail because people weren't paying back the loans. What happened next was that now even if you had money, somebody like me, you know, actually doesn't like spend excessive money, I couldn't get a loan. Now here in Turkey, things are, I think, at a different stage of the cycle. But the problem is, eventually I did get a loan. So, you know, it has like a happy, happy ending. But the fact is that suddenly the credit 
you know, the, the credit standards were strict. And they were strict partly because the banks didn't want to get burned again. But they were also strict because the banks didn't want to loan money to people buying houses anymore. I mean, if you want to take a guess, like, what do you think U.S. banks have mostly been doing the last two years? Like, have they been putting money into housing? Have they been investing in, you know, new businesses for the Internet? No, they've been loaning money to the government. <laughs> they've been loaning, well, trillions of dollars to the U.S. government. That's just basically called buying securities. You know, so what they're doing with your money, which is like deposited, you know, your money, which you might go and they might give it to you or they might not, depending on how many people go. What they're doing with that money is they're speculating in government debt. So that's the real problem with the Keynesian program. It's like up to a point, you can, in, you can inject money and credit into different areas of the system. And you might well prevent, let's say, a run on the banks if you improve confidence. And all of that is true up to a point. The problem is, once government spending goes beyond a certain level, then it suppresses other economic activity. I think somewhere in that sort of nexus of interrelated banking problems you know, lies the, the answer to this mystery of what happened in the Great Depression. I'm actually just, I, I didn't copy this one for you, but... I wanted to say that the element, again, which does not usually get emphasized in the Great Depression, is what happened to governments. You're always hearing about the private sector, you know, explosion of, of the, the stock market crash. Well, I'm going to list to you the number of countries that defaulted on their debts in one year alone, 1932. A couple of them rolled over into 1933. That is country sovereign debt default, like you, you've heard recently the problems with Greece, Ireland, you know, possibly Spain. Okay, here are the countries which, defeated, which defaulted on their debts in 1932. Austria, Bulgaria, Germany, Hungary, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, and Venezuela. That's pretty much like half the countries in Europe and South America. They all defaulted on their debts. So what did that mean? Who did they borrow the money from? Mostly from American banks. I mean, in this way, it's like the, the reverse, almost the mirror image of what's happening today. What's happening today, of course, is that the U.S. sucked in money from everywhere in the world and borrowed all this money. And then the U.S. is starting to default on these debts. In 1929, 1930, 31, it was the opposite. You know, America was a great creditor. American banks were loaning money to governments around the world, which then defaulted on their debts. So you had a couple of problems. It wasn't just the stock market crash. It wasn't just, you know, the kind of, shall we say, ill-fated interventions in the economy. It was in the end reckless lending by banks who were loaning to governments probably without, you know, a whole lot of soundness in their finances. Germany being the most prominent example of it, in part because of the reparations in indebted indebtedness. So the real issues then, I mean, it all has to do with banking. And banking is immensely complex. I mean, in some ways it's simple, in some ways it's not. But you think when you put your money in, in the bank and they're just like keeping it there for you, that's really only the beginning of the story. <laughs> because what they're really doing with your money is trying to make money out of it, and they're doing it in a lot of ways. You know, some of them possibly corrupt, some of them possibly sensible, but all of them risky, because there is no such thing as a guaranteed investment. So yes, banks do need to be regulated, the problem is it's not just that governments try to regulate them, but governments also sometimes push them in directions that they probably shouldn't go. Governments insist, for example, like the U.S. government did in these years, you should loan money to these countries because we want these countries to buy our products. Or more recently, what the U.S. government was doing was encouraging banks to loan money to people buying houses, because various politicians thought, you know, that was a good thing because we will increase. Um, the Republicans thought more homeowners means more Republican votes. The Democrats thought, you know, more minority people owning houses means more people voting for the Democrats. You know, everyone has an angle. The problem is when people try to master the business cycle and the loaning cycle, they often end up making, shall we say, questionable decisions about other people's money. And that, in the end, is really the crux of it, because you tend to be responsible with your own money. But when you're using other people's money, it's a lot easier to be reckless. Um, well, anyway, long story short, when you put all of this together, 
irresponsible decisions by central bankers thinking that they knew better than you know the market or than private investors in the end you know ill-fated government interventions you know in the economy uh, the problematic gold standard if you put it all together and there are a lot of different factors working together you ended up getting a great depression to end all great depressions you know one which suppressed economic activity I'll just give you a couple of uh, indices in America Manufacturing production down 77%, um, unemployment up to 30%, 34 million families without any kind of a breadwinner, without anyone earning income. Um, you had basically an economic Armageddon, which had obviously political consequences. Beginning in Europe, where the crash basically spreads by around 1931. Um, I'm not sure if we're quite out of time, but um, I think that's about where I wanted to wrap it up today. Um, please do the readings, though, because, again, this is not a subject that is easy to master. It's a very important subject, but with endless twists and turns. Um, and if you're interested, too, I mean, I think you should also be following current events, because in some ways, as I said, events might be running almost in parallel right now. Um, we had a crash several years ago, followed by government attempts to reinflate the bubble, which may simply mean that when it finally bursts this year or next, we're all going to be looking around for an umbrella. Um, so keep all of this in mind. Um, on Friday, I'm going to try to move into Stalin and the Soviet Union because I need to leave enough time next week for Hitler and Germany. So uh, we'll leave the Great Depression alone for now. Uh, about your quizzes, um, I haven't even looked at them yet, so <laughs> my apologies, but I will try to have them by next week, hopefully Wednesday, if not Wednesday, uh, Friday, okay? My apologies, it's, I really wish I could.